People accuse Austrian economics of being overly theoretical, but our guest this weekend, John O'Donnell, proves them wrong. He's applied Austrian economics consistently over his long career as both a successful investment banker and as the CEO of several large public companies. Now he teaches investment strategies online and speaks at conferences around the world as the head of the Online Trading Academy. John met Murray Rothbard in the 1970s and everything changed for him. He became a thorough Rothbardian and a dedicated libertarian, not to mention a close friend of hard money stalwarts like Doug Casey and Harry Brown. You'll enjoy hearing John's memories of how Murray owned a room, how Murray's incredible sense of humor was matched only by his sheer late night endurance, how measuring investment returns in fiat currency is nonsensical, and how Wharton, Harvard, and the London School of Economics produced so many clueless Keynesian MBAs. Stay tuned. Hello, John, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me on the show. John, for starters, is it safe to say you are roughly in the age group known as the baby boomers? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we're the class, I believe, is between 1946 and 1963. I was born in 46 and got out of high school in 64, so I'm, I'm right in the sweet swamp. I'm part of the first class marching through the pipeline. <laughs> so coming of age as you did in the 1960s and 1970s, were you ever on the left or on the right politically? Well, I grew up in a small farming community, but 90 miles north of St. Louis. And my father was the dyed in the wool. My father was born in 1910. He loved Roosevelt because he was convinced that Roosevelt got us out of the Great Depression. And uh, he used to tell me, he said, son, if you want to live like a Republican, you got to vote like a Democrat. And I guess uh, that's what I believed. I mean, I, I believed that was the politics across the dinner table at night. He was a small town pharmacist in Hannibal, Missouri who literally at the bottom of the Great Depression in 1930 uh, was swapping pharmaceuticals for food. So he went through the Great Depression, and he was convinced that Roosevelt got us out of the Great Depression, and that's all I really knew. Uh, I was fortunate as a kid to handle a lot of coinage. Uh, I had a paper route, and I uh, would get paid in dimes, quarters, and halves, you know, pre-1964, 900 fine silver. As a kid, I had as a hobbyist, I was a coin collector, so I was very sensitive to, and of course, I handled a lot of coinage in my dad's pharmacy. So I was really sensitive to a little bit about the history of money from a coin, from a, from a youth coin collector's perspective. And then um, later on in life, I had the opportunity, uh, I guess it was the late, it's probably the late 60s. I think Murray Rothbard's book was first published around 1964, What Has Government Done to Our Money? But that was really a, a great introduction for me. And it gave me a grounding and a foundation and a perspective of the world as a young college student. I didn't get out of college from 1968 uh, with a, from a totally different perspective. And, you know, when I first read through it, um, and I was just kind of recently looking back at the table of contents, the whole concept of, of money being the denominator in a free society, uh, the fact that why does the government have a monopoly on money? Um, and I, it, it, my father and I had long conversations because after reading Murray's book, What Has Government Done to the, uh, Money, it, it, it really caused me to ask, start asking some very serious questions about the common denominator of all of our lives, which is the money unit. Tell us more about your experiences reading Rothbard and what impact his work has had on you. Well, the first book that really had a big impact on my life was uh, uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money. There were really three books. Of course, that that led me to the likes of Henry Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Easy Lesson. That ultimately, believe it or not, led me to other readings um, in uh, by Harry Brown, uh, the former libertarian president. Harry wrote a book around 1970, published by Arlington House, that very well could have been about the time Lou Rockwell was there. I think Lou Rockwell came out of the Arlington House environment, didn't he? And, Indeed, and he that, did. And that being said, he wrote a wonderful best-selling book uh, called How to Profit from the Coming Devaluation. I didn't know what it really a devaluation was. I never heard of any much of any, anything like that before. But what happened to me as I was teaching school after I got out of college, uh, in the summer of 71, I didn't have anything to do, so I started a, a coin brokerage business off my kitchen table, and I would call up people, and I, I'd I said, look, I think Nixon's going to devalue the dollar only because I had read that in a paragraph in Harry Brown's book. 
And people were buying gold and silver coins from me. And, of course, in August of 71, Nixon did devalue the dollar. And everybody thought I was kind of an economic genius, or some people thought I was clairvoyant. How did you know this? And I was embarrassed to tell them, well, all I did was read this book, and it gave me a heads up. But it really was a life-changing experience for me. Then I started going to monetary seminars. Jim Blanchard hosted his first monetary seminar in New Orleans, the Gold Conference. He had started something called the National Committee for Monetary Reform, which was really focused on legalizing gold. And I met Murray Rothbard there. And I happened to meet Murray. Uh, I had read his book, of course, but I, I wasn't, I was a young uh, businessman. Uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't studied formal Austrian uh, uh, economics other than those three books that I had read. Um, but I really didn't really appreciate who Murray was at that time. Later on, I would go on and, and, and meet Murray uh, at other seminars sponsored out in Los Angeles in the late 70s, early 80s on three different occasions by a gentleman you may know, I know Lou Rockwell knows him, named Ken Gervino. Uh, he had a, uh, at least were monetary seminars. There were, there were three or four of these hosted across the United States, and they were really my foundation to break bread and, and meet the likes of Doug Casey, uh, Murray Rothbard, um, uh, Harry Brown, and I became uh, rather close uh, friends. Uh, and it, it gave me the platform to start my reading and, and, and really helped me in my career and my, my business dramatically. Uh, and I've, I've gone on to become entrepreneur, finalist on Entrepreneur of the Year contest twice in Orange County uh, and now one of the, uh, considered one of the founding principles of Online Trading Academy. And uh, we're the largest trading education school in the world with 35 campuses spread over seven countries. And all of that's grounded in the power of education should be in the private sector. We take no government funding whatsoever. And we're really grounded in, you know, what I would call Miesian, uh, Rothbardian principles. So you're clearly a veteran of the hard money scene. Going back to the 70s, what were your impressions of Murray as a person or as a man? Did you get to know him personally at all? I thought he was the most humorous, jovial, lighthearted uh, person I'd ever met in my life. When I would meet him at a cocktail party, or occasionally I had the opportunity, I would MC a panel and I would introduce him. And then later in the evening, you know, most of the speakers would be invited to a cocktail party, a social hour. And I was just stunned and amazed at his humor. His, um, uh, everybody loved him. When Rory entered the walk in a room, he owned the room. The room lit up. Um, I mean, he was like a magnet. Uh, and, and, you know, I, and, I never have met anyone in my life. Now, I was a young man in the early 1970s. I've never met anyone in my life that had the endurance of Murray Rothbard. That guy, that guy could go and go and go until the wee hours of the morning, and uh, and he would just uh, he would just own the room uh, wherever he went. It, it was it was like a shining light walked in the room. And and again, in those early days, I didn't fully appreciate who he was. Only uh, as later in life, as I started to become more aware of his, uh, his of his power, his position, and what I call the whole libertarian movement, that I truly appreciate it. See, in my mind, I believe that the greatest economist that's ever lived was Ludwig von Mises. But I really also believe in my heart of hearts, the greatest U.S. economist that the U.S. ever produced on American soil was Murray Rothbard. And I mean that sincerely. Well, after meeting Murray, how did you begin to morph into both a business person who's been the CEO of several public companies and also an investment guru? And, and did Austrian economics shape your career in both those areas? Yes, it did. It, it gave me a, a grounding in principles. Uh, I've always felt, when we look at investments as an example, um, I've always felt that when you do accounting or you, you measure your rates of return in a fiat currency world, it is delusional because the currency is purchasing power parity Roller to a basket appears, uh, is usually measured at, by the dollar index, is an illusion. So what I, the fact that I was a coin collector, the fact that Murray's book, book turned me on to the to the benefits of hard money. That money should be a denominator; it's a measuring unit. And I have always followed a website here recently uh, where I have priced goods and services in grams of gold uh, or in uh, grams of silver. 
And uh, for instance, one of the simplest, easiest ways to do that is to use uh, the U.S. silver coins, dimes, quarters, and has been in pre-1964, because each one dollar of face value, i.e. four quarters, has 0.72 ounces of silver. And so if you know the spot price of silver at any given moment of time, it's a very simple calculation to figure out um, how many quarters uh, with one dollar face value does it take to buy a gallon of gasoline, and how many fiat dollars does it take to buy a gallon of gasoline? And very clearly, if you do your accounting that way and use hard money as your denominator, it causes you to look at the world, uh, measure risk, measure reward from a totally different perspective. Uh, for instance, everybody talks today about an eighteen thousand Dow, uh, but yet. In 2000, when the Dow was at 15,000, or should be uh, 11,700, it took about 44 ounces of gold to buy one unit of the Dow. Today, it takes about 15 units of gold, or 15 ounces of gold, to buy one unit of the Dow. Now, the Dow earnings capacity in fiat money has risen over the last 14 years, but its purchasing power parity in hard money, i.e. gold, uh, has dramatically dropped. And the reason I like to use gold as a measuring rod for wealth uh, fluctuation uh, is simply because no central bank can print gold. And it, it's the elegance of gold um, in, in measuring the value of something. And that, you know, gold fluctuates like everything, but everything fluctuates in purchasing power parity. But I needed a denominator that I could hang my head on that gave me good value. And it helped me Discover, for instance, when Murray would talk about what is money. Uh, money is, is the, the, the inflation is an increase in the money supply and credit relative to available goods and services. But I amend that definition a little bit, and I call inflation an increase in the money supply and credit mark to market chasing a relatively fixed amount of goods and services. And when you look at the money denominator from that perspective, it allows you to get on top of the credit purge cycles that we went through in real estate and in the stock market. And a lot of people don't understand between 2007 and 2010, the average net worth in fiat money of the average American home dropped over 40%. And we haven't seen numbers like that since the 1930s. So if you look at the credit component of the money supply, it allows you to do better economic decision making and forecasting about when one of these credit card cycles might come along. Well, John, isn't it interesting, though, how clueless most investors are about inflation? Because you'll hear average investors, average Joe's say, well, the return I care about is my return net of taxes or net of fees or net of mutual fund loads, et cetera. But you don't hear people saying, well, what's my return net of inflation? Absolutely. And uh, I had a discussion. I have a 20-year-old son that, that was whining the other day about minimum wage. And um, I said, son, well, you know, why is it you, you believe your employer is only offering you $7 an hour uh, for your wage or for your, your labor? And, you know, he mumbled something about how he was probably getting ripped off. And I said, no, I mean, very candidly, maybe you're only giving that employer $7 an hour of output. But I said, when I was your age, son, my minimum wage was a dollar and a quarter an hour. He said, well, Dad, you were really getting ripped off. I said, well, wait a minute. I was paid five quarters, 25 cents, for one hour of my labor. Now, you're a lot smarter than I am, son. You've got better tools than I had when I was 20 years old. But I said, my dollar and a quarter of 900 fine silver coins today have substantial amount of silver in them. And I can go purchase with a dollar and a quarter of silver coins about three gallons of gasoline. How many gallons of gasoline can you purchase with seven fiat dollars? He said, well, I'm, you know, this was a, a bit ago, maybe four months, six months ago. He said, I can buy barely two gallons of gasoline. So I said, what changed? Did the value of the labor change? Did the value of the gasoline change? Or did the value of the money change? And he'd scratch his head there for a moment and think, try to think that through. It's the money's purchasing power that changes. The denominator changes. And unless you keep your finger on the pulse of the denominator <laughs> and what has government done to the denominator, you can never really figure this, this out. And, and, and unfortunately, this is not 
taught in our university systems. They're not teaching these principles at Wharton. They're not teaching these principles at the London School of Economics. The only place you're going to get it are organizations like the Mises Institute, perhaps FEE, and a couple of other organizations. That's about it. That's where you're going to get this information. You're going to get it in the private sector. You're certainly not going to get it at, at Harvard or Stanford. John, you've been both the CEO of publicly traded companies, and you've been an investment banker. So tell us, does the average corporate officer or Wall Street banker have any real understanding of money, the Fed, or business cycle theory, or are they all just thorough Keynesians by default? Well, first of all, the basic foundation in which we think there's need for the goods and services that we produce is that Wall Street has told the little guy his whole life that you can't learn to time the market, that you're not smart enough, you don't have all the information, you're not willing to put in the work. And that, therefore, Wall Street's message has always been their solution is just turn your money over to Wall Street and they'll do it for you and you go about your life. Our message at Online Trading Academy is different. Our message is you can learn to time the market. you got to put some energy and work into it, but it is a skill that you can acquire if you're properly coached and you have a methodology that has been vetted with high probability of success, no guarantees. You can learn to time the market with remarkable accuracy if you're willing to take responsibility for your own financial affairs and become what we call self-directed to the market. And the online brokerage industry allows you, through the use of ETFs and direct access trading in stocks and futures contracts and options and bond market, you can take responsibility for your own financial affairs, including be responsible for your own pension resources uh, in self-directed IRAs uh, and pension plans. So first of all, you have to have an appetite to want to do that. Now, what we teach is markets are impacted by macroeconomic principles. Are the markets going through, is the economy going through a period of cheap liberal credit? Certain sectors at any given moment in time are credit challenged. Other sectors, the banking industry and other channels of credit are freely lending for growth and expansion. We want to own those interest industries and those sectors that are doing that. Conversely, uh, and the best example of that right now might be the energy industry. It might, it might have been the real estate industry in 2006. We also know that there are macroeconomic periods of time where some of these sectors go through credit contraction. That And therefore, those industries are going to shrink. There's going to be a reset in price and valuation in, prob- in nominal terms. And we can only trade in nominal terms for all practical purposes because when you make settlement on a trade, you get paid fiat money everywhere in the world. That being said, we know that one industry comes into favor because of the availability of cheap liberal credit, and another industry might go out of favor because of cheap liberal credit conditions. So we, first of all, want to look at the macro world we live in and, in context, trade the short-term price movement. Now, short-term price movements may be as little as one day of price movement or one week or you know a couple of quarters of price movement. And we have developed a proprietary methodology, which we reward a patent for, around supply and demand, identifying on a price chart, institutional order flow, and imbalances between supply and demand of institutional order flow, where there is about to be precipitated a price change. And we want to trade that price change. If the signal tells us to buy the market, we want to buy the market because price is about to go higher using our patented strategy. Now, if the market is about to go lower and pivot in price, we're not opposed to shorting the market. Matter of fact, we like to sell unsustainable rallies in a bull market. So we have no dog in this fight as to which way price goes. We're not a perma bull. We're not a perma bear. We're a trader. We either take liquidity from the market or we bring liquidity to the market. But we teach our adult learners uh, in our 35 centers across the world that it's their responsibility to take charge of their financial assets. I don't think anybody who comes to us, most of our clients are baby boomers. I don't think any of them want to be a ward of the state or a burden on their children. So using sound Austrian economic principles, it's certainly better uh, than trying to use Keynesian principles to make an informed choice on when to buy or sell a capital asset. And I think we probably do more work in Austrian in applied Austrian economic principles to the trading and investing decision than probably any public or private 
institution out there. Well, it's interesting that you say that. And of course, your own background is a little unusual in this sense. You've been a CEO of big publicly traded companies, so you've been a manager. But you've also been an investment banker. And most people who have been one of those two things have not been both. So let me ask you this. Does the average corporate officer or the average Wall Street banker have any real understanding of money, of the Fed, of business cycle theory? Or are they all just thorough Keynesians, at least by default? They almost all are Keynesian by default because they come out of Keynesian university MBA models. If you have a Harvard MBA, or if you went to MIT or Stanford MBA or the London School of Economics, you have been washed and your whole academic experience drank the Keynesian Kool-Aid. Where are you going to get introduced to Austrian economic principles? It's not taught, but at a few small universities, there's a couple of exceptions to that. But unless you came out of that environment, you don't know what you don't know. And unfortunately, all the MBA programs uh, or all the apprenticeship models in the investment banking community are saturated with Keynesian thought. And um, I don't think, uh, I mean, there's a handful of, of investment bankers that have overcome their Keynesian exposure and were, have become self-educated through studying Mises' work and uh, Hayek's work and Rothbard's work and and, 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 you know, the Mises Institute has been foundational in making all of that intellectual property available at remarkably affordable uh, rates. And, of course, you now have your own online courses that are outrageously affordable uh, for anyone who wants to learn these principles. So if you're looking for truth, sooner or later you have to drift away from the Keynesian perspective to the Austrian perspective. John, I couldn't agree with you more. Thanks so much for your time and for a fascinating interview. Ladies and gentlemen, you can find out more about John O'Donnell at tradingacademy.com. Have a great weekend.